Hello everyone, it's me Mark, and I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of The Eclectic as a Podcast. And today I'll be talking about the official NBA restart, and what I think of how the teams look based off the scrimmage games they played, some of the odds the teams have going into these eight games trying to change their seating for the playoffs. And then I'm going to be talking about a few NBA related stories that just seem (laughs) odd and funny. So with the scrimmage games, we got to see the top NBA players and the NBA teams come back and knock some rust off. We got to see the coaches test out some rotations they wouldn't have test out during the regular season. And we also got to see some rookies on some of the higher seeded teams get minutes that they weren't getting during the regular season and just get some experience out of it since they most likely won't get it during the seeding games and also when the playoffs start. So quick refresher when it comes to the NBA restart. We're getting eight seeding games, they're calling it, to wrap up the regular season and also give teams a chance to change their seeding positions to have a better spot when it comes to the playoffs and also to give teams that would have gotten knocked out of the playoffs that they just stopped at the top 16 best records. When it comes to the East, Pretty much the seeding, I think, is what's going to matter to at least the top six teams. The teams are pretty much going to be setting up for better matchups for the first round of the playoffs. So when it comes to the one seed, Milwaukee, I think they're a team that's pretty much built to make that run to the finals. They literally made that team almost perfect for Giannis to pretty much do what he does, drive and kick it out the shooters. And they have the perfect defense. They have versatility with their bigs. I mean, just watching the scrimmage games, I saw the Lopez twins hitting three-pointers like it's nothing, which was kind of a shocker. Um, They picked up Marvin Williams, like, before the lockdown, who was another versatile forward, what, 6'9", and pretty much been able to stay in the league just based off of shooting. And they did all that, and during that uh, scrimmage, they didn't have... Eric Bledsoe, who's been putting up like 20 points during the regular season. And their bench has also been solid. You got George Hill, who's been a solid veteran. You've had Pat Cunningham, who wasn't at the scrimmage, but he's been solid all the season. And you had Dante DeVincenzo from Villanova, who's really, really scary on both sides of the ball, especially on defense. I think with them, they're definitely just going to go all out to hold the one seed since what they had, they had like a six game lead over Toronto. And I think they're just going to make sure that Giannis wraps up the MVP since there's a lot of talk of possibly LeBron being the closest person to him in the race for MVP. So I think they're just going to wash these eight games out with no problem. Maybe start resting once they get to the seventh and eighth game. But really, I think the team they may want to see during the playoffs for the first round, because I think they're going to win first round no problem either way. I think they'll either want to see Brooklyn or Washington, which I don't think is going to happen because Washington definitely can't get the eighth seed. Because I think Orlando does have some matchups that can make the series go to at least five or six for them but they they don't have to worry about the first round it's all about the second round and possibly the eastern conference finals so next up is the two seed toronto raptors toronto definitely needs to hold on to the two seed because again they definitely want to play one of the weaker teams in orlando or Brooklyn, because I think if they fall to a three seed, they'll most likely end up versus Indiana or Philadelphia, depending on how the eight games go. And there'll definitely be a bad matchup for them. Like, I think they won't be able to just cruise through like they possibly can. Because once you get down to that three and lower, the teams definitely get a little bit more the same at being like the same competitive level. So I think Toronto definitely wants to hold on to the two seed. And if they can possibly ring off eight wins to get the one seed, that will definitely help their chances. But I don't think that's going to happen at all. Next is the third seed, Boston Celtics, which I definitely think they need to move up. Because as of right now, I don't think they would want to play either Philadelphia, Indiana, just because matchups would be an issue with, at least when it comes to the bigs. Again, Boston, they have the skilled players. They have all the wings, but that's kind of the issue. They don't have like a true center down in the paint. They what run with three small forwards in their starting lineup and a regular point guard. So I think when it comes to Philadelphia and Indiana, who have 
really good competitive bigs, it would be an issue for them to go up against them in the first round. And I think that would be definitely not something they'd want to deal with, at least starting off. So I think they would definitely want to move up to give them a better chance when it comes to the first round of the playoffs. Next, we have the four seed, who I think is maybe the most balanced team in the East, and that's the Miami Heat. The Miami Heat, I think they just have to get consistency. Like, seeding-wise, I don't think it matters who they play. It's all about consistency, because they have the versatility, they have a lot of good players, and I think their young players definitely played way better than expected, because they had Kendrick Nunn, who was definitely in the running for Rookie of the Year, Tyler Hero, definitely, definitely better than expected. Then you also had Bam Adebayo, who's maybe the front runner for the most improved player of the year. And then when it comes to everybody else on the roster, obviously they have Jimmy Butler, who they're pretty much is their star of the show. And then you have Andre Iguodala coming off the bench, Jay Crowder, Kelly Olynyk. They, you know, they have a real solid, solid team. I think it's just a matter of consistency, because I think they can really go toe to toe with pretty much all the teams in the East, no problem, but they just have to be able to be consistent for four games, and they could possibly even make it to the Eastern Conference if they just stay consistent, and I think that's their main focus they need to do is stay consistent, because health isn't an issue, and chemistry isn't an issue, it's just being consistent for all the games, and I think the eight seeding games may help them when it comes to rolling into the playoffs. And so the fifth seed is the Indiana Pacers. The Indiana Pacers have definitely been a team that overachieved, you can say. I mean, Victor Oladipo was an all-star, but he's pretty much missed the majority of the season. They had DeMontis Sabonis, who was, what, the surprise all-star for the entire league and just played amazing. And then the rest of the team has just been players that are just solid. You got Malcolm Brogdon who started off, I think, injured, but he came in and rolled in like with nothing. Aaron Holiday and Justin Holiday have been solid. But I think with them, well, based off the scrimmage, is is Victor Oladipo completely ready to roll in after being out for so long? And how are they going to do since DeMontis Sabonis is being out due to a foot injury that he got during one of the scrimmage games? So now it's a matter of seeing if players like Miles Turner or possibly another player off the bench can step up and take advantage of these eight games. Can Victor Oladipo get some more rust out of the way and show why he was an all-star? And can they hold that same team concept over achieving style that they had during the regular season and roll it over into the playoffs? And so now the sixth seed, 76ers. With them, I think they can definitely be the most dangerous team and that's based off what I've seen in the scrimmage and that's with them making a lineup change and they finally decided to make Ben Simmons into a power forward instead of point guard and I think with that that will definitely help them offensively and it will set Ben Simmons up to actually get more points and less responsibility to start up the offense and bring the ball up. So I think once they take advantage of these eight seeding games to possibly move up and get their chemistry straight, they should be a little bit more dangerous. But I think overall with the team, it won't actually move until Joel Embiid gets more consistent. Because when Joel Embiid kind of gets rolling, he's definitely the best center in the entire league. So. I think with Ben getting used to not being the point guard and having Joel Embiid get rolling and also getting consistency from Tobias Harris and Al Horford, who's going to be coming off the bench most likely now, I think the Sixers can definitely be the most dangerous team in the East. I already feel like they're kind of built to compete against all the teams in the East. That's including Milwaukee. Now, time for the seventh seed, the whole city. Orlando Magic. With the Magic, I just feel as though they're just a filler team. They don't have the roster to really compete. They have some young players that can really take advantage of the extra games in the playoffs. And that's being Markel Fultz, who 
definitely has been able to salvage his career in Orlando after being shipped out of the Philly. Then you got Jonathan Isaac, who's definitely showing that he's a real defensive top tier player, or will definitely be one. And then other than that, the team is just it's just not built right, and it's not really competitive. And I think they don't really have to worry about losing their seeding spot, but they just. They, they shouldn't expect anything past the first round. I'll just say that. Now, the HC Brooklyn Nets. A team based off the moves they made in the offseason, you would think would possibly be the one or the two seed. But unfortunately, their season kind of went down the spiral due to injuries of Kevin Durant, who didn't even start the season, and Kyrie Irving. And then as soon as the season started rolling, they had lost Karis LeVert for a while, but he's back now. They fired their head coach, Kenny Atkinson. They lost their sixth man in Spencer Dinwiddie due to coronavirus and also DeAndre Jordan also to the coronavirus. So when it comes to this team that they sent to Orlando, it's pretty much a showcase team. It's a team made up of a few rotational players that would usually be with the team, which is Karis LeVert, Joe Harrison, and Jared Allen. And then it's a whole bunch of players that wouldn't start or possibly even be in the rotation or just like late pickups, kind of like Tyler Johnson, Jamal Crawford, and Michael Beasley. So overall, this is just a showcase team for the players that got signed on and trying to prove themselves to Brooklyn and other NBA teams that they can maybe sign on to later. And also for the temporary head coach and Jacques Mon who's maybe trying to prove that he can be a head coach in the NBA again. So there's nothing to really expect from Brooklyn. They maybe can knock off a few teams in the seeding games, like possibly get like one or two wins, but I don't think they're any type of threat once playoffs hit. It's just a showcase team that's pretty much a filler. And the next team is the Washington Wizards at the ninth seed who's trying to play their way in, and they're six games behind. And I think they're in a worse position than Brooklyn when it comes to roster because their team is made up of the same situation. But with their players that are usually in the rotation, they're a bunch of young guys. You have like Rui Hachimaru, who they drafted this year, Troy Brown from last year. And you have Maurice Wagner that they got from uh, the Lakers. They're just young guys. and rotational players it's i don't even think that they can play their way into the ac for these so they're kind of just there to get experience and also showcase their talents to other teams and possibly to stay on the washington for the long run now on to the western conference starting off with the one c los angeles lakers i think with the lakers the maybe the best thing that could have happened when it comes to the pandemic is that lebron james got months of rest. I think that's like the main thing that helps the Lakers is that they're going to refresh LeBron James and they can only make it to the finals is because they have LeBron James. Even though Anthony Davis is having an amazing season right now that's only being overlooked because he's playing with LeBron. I think the team overall with them having LeBron who has the experience and has the ability to put the team on his back anytime is the reason why they should make it easy on themselves and hold on to the one seed so that when it's time for the playoffs, they'll end up playing possibly Memphis or some other, or another young team like New Orleans or possibly a struggling team like Portland. And playing those teams will make it a lot more easy for them to get to the finals and just put less wear and tear on LeBron and also the other veteran players that they have on the team. Because falling to the two seed would have them possibly set up to go up against Dallas or even Houston, based on how the seeding games go. And I think both of those teams could literally give them not an actual scare, but at least a long series, possibly six and seven games when it comes to those two teams. And I think the less wear and tear on that team, the Lakers, the better they'll be to make a run for the finals. Next, we have the LA Clippers, the team that has definitely proven to be the biggest hurdle for the Lakers, just based on the games they played during the regular season, but also based on the efforts that they made on making this roster, starting from the off season when they were able to sign Kawhi Leonard and then also be able to pick up Paul George in a trade that 
uh, may seem kind of a little bit off balance, but it's definitely worked out for the Clippers in the long run. And then just all the free agents they were able to pick up just during the season that just fit the roster perfectly for what they want to do. So the Clippers, I think they definitely have just as much of an opportunity to make the finals as the Lakers, and they just have to worry about the Lakers. Even though they don't have the most spectacular big men, only having, what, Ivik Zubak and picking up Joe Kim Noah before, I guess, they got into the bubble, they pretty much made it work this whole season, and that's why they've been able to get the two seed in the West because of their experience and the coaching from Doc Rivers has pretty much made everything work and made them competitive at the high level they've been at. So next we have the three seed Denver Nuggets, a team that's that's been pretty great, but the timing of their ascension is not great, simply due to the fact of the two teams ahead of them being the Lakers and the Clippers having the more experience and also you can say the more talented players on their teams. So even though they have Jokic, who's been amazing, Jamal Murray, Gary Harris, it's just the timing of the team's ascension that's the problem. Like, they'll pop, obviously make it to the second round, but I don't think that they can get any further just because they don't, they're not ready yet. That's the best thing to say. They're just not ready to go up against LeBron and AD for a seven-game series. I don't think they're ready for the Clippers for a seven-game series. They just don't have the players that can go toe-to-toe with those super elite level players yet. But they're a fun team to watch. They definitely have growing talent like Bol Bol and Michael Porter Jr. that will make this team even better in the next, I want to say, maybe year or two. But right now, it's all about the timing. So I think with this upcoming seeding games and playoff, series even though they're three seed they got to use this time to actually grow overall as a team to possibly push themselves into the elite tier status when it comes to their players so next is the four seed utah jazz with this team they're kind of in the same boat as denver but but not as talented as denver i guess that's the best way to put it um with utah it's just they definitely overachieve kind of like with Indiana in the East. Um, Donovan Mitchell has what had an all-star season, Rudy Gobert an all-star, but they just, they aren't there to compete with the Clippers and the Lakers yet. And overall, I mean, we have to see what they do if they get past the first round, because when you get to the five and lower seeds, your teams that can actually compete with Utah and possibly even beat them in the first round. So I think the moves they made, like getting Mike Conley, will possibly take the pressure off the rest of the Utah team since he has a lot of playoff experience, but Mike Conley himself hasn't had a good season. So you have to see what type of Mike Conley are you gonna get. Are you gonna get the one that's kind of been off the season? Or are you gonna get the old Memphis Grizzly Mike Conley because he can obviously be the ace in the hole for them when it comes to getting out of the first round and possibly making a competitive series in the second round. So next up we have the five seed Oklahoma City Thunder and they're definitely a team that can possibly knock off Utah and even Denver if the seeding goes right for them. Shea Gilgis Alexander has been amazing definitely in the running for most improved player of the year. Chris Paul is, you know, the point guard. I mean, everywhere he goes, a team's going to get better. And I think he's definitely proved himself. The fact that he was able to keep this team up and competitive after everybody thought they were just going to be a team that was definitely going to be in rebuild mode after getting rid of Russell Westbrook and Paul George. So they're solid. I mean, they're young, they're active, they have good veterans in like Steven Adams and Danilo Gallinari. So when it comes to the three and the four seed, they can easily make it competitive and possibly even knock them off. So OKC is a team that I'm pretty sure Utah and Denver would want to avoid. And I think they're definitely going to put pressure on teams to actually compete in the West to have better seating because OKC is like a team you don't know how to really plan for just because of how young they are, but at the same time, 
how they have the experienced veterans that have been able to make these young players way better than expected. So next we have the six seed Houston Rockets. It was a team that's definitely changed their dynamics multiple times during the season just based on all the roster moves they've made. They're a team you have to respect because of James Harden and Russell Westbrook, but it's just a team that's built very small. Like they literally have a 6'7 Robert Covington as their starting center and his backup is a 6'9 Jeff Green. So it's really going to be on the shoulders of James Harden and Russell Westbrook and also getting them to be able to work together when it comes to playoff time because during the regular season, Russell Westbrook definitely started off slow, but as soon as you got past, I guess I'm going to say the first couple months, he definitely got rolling and they were able to bounce off each other. But we got to see how that works out in the playoffs since Westbrook and James Harden definitely don't have the best resumes when it comes to playoffs just based off all the years of what James Harden going into a turnover machine or Russell Westbrook possibly just imploding on both sides of the ball so having those two together hopefully they can balance each other out and carry Houston because I think they definitely need to move up in the seating because right now I think if they were to end up playing let's say Denver they definitely would get knocked out of the first round um Utah is definitely a better matchup for them so hopefully they take advantage of the eight seats to get their chemistry right and possibly figure out how they want to play for the playoffs because just looking at the roster this is not a team built to make a run for the championship at all so next we have the seven seed dallas mavericks the mavericks are definitely one of the more entertaining teams not just in the bubble but overall in the nba because of their second year player and all-star luka Doncic. this team is definitely I want to say somewhat of a filler team, but at the same time, though, because they're in the West, they can obviously make it competitive for the other teams, but I think they're definitely going to use this time to get more experience, and if they can possibly move up in the seedings, they'll definitely try to take a chance to possibly still a first-round win against one of the middle teams, since I think at the most they can get to the six or possibly the five seed if they go on a good run when it comes to the seeding game. Next is the most surprising team, and that is the Memphis Grizzlies, a team that was supposed to be in rebuild mode, but has actually overachieved compared to any team, especially when you look at how young their roster is. You have John Morant, most likely the winner of this year's Rookie of the Year. You have Brandon Clark, another rookie who's definitely ahead of schedule when it comes to his playing and then you have Jaron Jackson a second year player who's definitely played great so far and overall the team is just way ahead of the curve this is some team that you expect to be good in two or three years but they're literally playing amazing in the west the fact that they're the AC is just still shocking but now with these seeding games they have to pretty much hold on to the eighth seed if they want to actually compete in the playoffs just because of how the NBA has set up this restart with five other teams being behind them to possibly get the eighth seed from them and just completely knock them out of the playoffs. So the way they've played, they can possibly hold it, but the teams behind them well, two teams, I want to say Portland and the Spurs, are two teams with enough experience to possibly take it from them. So I think another amazing achievement that the Memphis Grizzlies can do when it comes to this season is being able to hold on to the AC. I think when the playoffs roll and they possibly make it, they won't be able to obviously compete against the Lakers or the Clippers, but just the experience and being able to play more games and be able to say that Hey, we made it into the playoffs being this young and not too many teams or people are expecting us to make it will be great motivation for them when they get ready for the next season. Now for the ninth seed in the West, the Portland Trailblazers. Portland Trailblazers are in the position they're at due to the fact of injuries. I mean, they played pretty much the entire season without their starting center, Nurkic, played almost half the season without Damian Lillard. 
and they also didn't have their backup power forward Zach Collins. But I think the fact that they were all in the bubble, they all were able to play in a scrimmage, that they can easily take the eighth seed from Memphis. And I think health is the main thing they need to have when it comes to making a run in the playoffs. Because based off the scrimmage games and some of the regular season games, the players they have coming off the bench are actually pretty solid. Um, Anthony Simons is definitely a player that I wasn't high on even back when he got drafted, just because of him coming pretty much straight out of high school. He's definitely proven me wrong on how talented and how quick he was able to adapt to the NBA. And then you have somebody like Gary Trent Jr., someone who's definitely worked his way into the roster and definitely proved that he's capable of playing on the NBA level. And then when you have Hassan Whiteside accepting the role of a backup center, it's kind of hard not to consider this Portland team a threat to make it to the playoffs and being a threat in the playoffs. Now, time to talk about the 10th seed New Orleans Pelicans, the team that I'm pretty sure everybody in the NBA wants to see make it into the playoffs. Um, With the New Orleans Pelicans, the thing they have going against them is youth. They're still a young team. They got Zion, Brandon Ingram, Lonzo Ball, and then just a whole bunch of other young guys in their roster, and not too many veterans. They have J.J. Redick and Drew Holiday and Derek Favors, but it's mostly a young team. But they're talented enough to make the run to the AC. I mean, Brandon Ingram is another player in the running for most improved. It was also an all-star this year. Um, Drew Holiday, I think he's definitely the main player, even more than Zion that needs to show up if they want to make a run because he's, his consistency on both sides of the ball is what they're going to need to have a real chance to make it into the playoffs. Next, we have the 11th seed, Sacramento Kings, a team that I feel as though is definitely filler, especially based on what I've seen during the regular season and also during the scrimmage games. And the fact that they're also dealing with the injury of their starting point guard, De'Aaron Fox, who's dealing with an ankle injury, I just don't see how they can possibly be any type of threat for the eighth seed right now. And at the 12th seed, unfortunately, it's my team, the San Antonio Spurs. I think this is definitely the year that the playoff streak finally ends at 22. The roster right now is too young, too unbalanced. We're missing LaMarcus Aldridge, our second leading scorer. We're missing Trey Lyles, a player that definitely could have filled in for Aldridge, but he's out due to appendectomy. And right now this team is just built on balance. We have too many guards. We're way too young. I mean, we have Popovich, who it's always good to believe in, but the way this seating is set up and their schedule is set up, we at least have to win like seven out of the eight games. So when it comes to the Spurs, I don't want to not give up hope on Popovich, but the team is just not built to make the type of run, not just to a championship, but even to make it into the playoffs. And whenever their season finally ends, I'm definitely going to make a whole (laughs) special podcast just for them. And so now to the last possible team to make it into the playoffs, the 13th seed. Phoenix Suns. Phoenix Suns have the talent, but the same thing with the Spurs is they're young, but they're definitely a more balanced team than the Spurs right now. And for them to make it to the playoffs, they would definitely have to win all eight of these seeding games, and I just don't think they can possibly do it. I think with the Suns, they're just going to use this time to get more experience for the players, build up more chemistry, and possibly get ready for next year because they're way too far in the hole. So that's my thoughts when it comes to all the 22 teams that are getting ready for the seeding game. So now on to the stories that I guess are NBA related that I found funny during this whole restart. First being Lou Williams of the LA Clippers being seen at the Magic City <laughs> Strip Club in Atlanta during his time outside of the bubble for a family emergency, possibly for food. <laughs> Um, the situation wouldn't have blown up if it wasn't for the rapper Jake Harlow taking a picture of him and Lou, and then people just putting pieces together, finding out that, like, based on the picture, you see 
Lou wearing a face mask that I guess was only given to the players in the bubble because Jay Carlo tried to I guess lie and cover it up saying like oh it's an old picture I was just reminiscing about my time with Lou and then investigators mostly people online kind of put two and two together and it's like nah that's a little bit recent so I think you know he Lou was free to do whatever he wanted as long as he was safe <laughs> during his time outside of the bubble but I think them trying to cover it up and then the fact that it popped up with him being in a place that you wouldn't say is the safest place to be at during a pandemic but to me it's funny just because of how they try to cover it up and end up fumbling the whole situation and now Lou is currently on quarantine for 10 days and it's obviously going to affect the team because he's going to miss the first seeding game. And the next NBA related story that definitely gave me a good laugh was the story about Michael Jordan at a resort recently on film getting caught talking trash to random people he was playing basketball with. And the main highlight of it was him telling a guy to look him up on YouTube. <laughs> So I guess he assumed the guy didn't know that he was Michael Jordan. The fact that at 57, Michael Jordan is still hyper competitive, still talking trash, and just being able to play at his age is just hilarious. At the same time, though, it just reminds you of how great of a player he was. And with that, I'll wrap this podcast up. Hopefully you'll enjoy this episode. Remember to stay safe, wear your mask, keep your distance, and enjoy the sports that we have that's going on right now. Baseball, the WNBA, the NBA. At the same time, don't forget the major issues we still have going on in the world.